Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by Boxing Hall of Famer Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good. You look great, Ken. You you uh your barber got there. I see that. He he, he <laughs> hopped on that. You sent that jet over and he hopped on it and he got over there right away. So you you look you look perfect as usual, but even more so now that the Thank you. You, you got hit up with your your <laughs> weekly haircut um and your shirt looks very nice it, it, it looks it looks great um it looks great it's a nice shirt and it has a nice little uh saying there i think it fits into our show that's right i think it fits in pretty well shirts from our newest sponsor ape man strong ape man is a brand that believes in inspiring empowering people to overcome the obstacles in their life their company motto is strong has many forms find yours this may be physical strength it may be mental strength or it may be emotional strength but depending on the challenge you'll need to find one of these one of one or all of these strengths to overcome the mission is to encourage the building of these strengths designed and printed in the usa every shirt has a different meaning behind it and a motivated card describing this meaning the shirts the shirts are awesome quality very comfortable and look great these guys also give a bunch of money to various causes and are heavily involved in different charity work since 2019 they've donated over eighty thousand dollars to 37 different charities so please check them out at apemanstrong.com and find your strong and teddy i know that the uh charity angle hits a chord with you and i know they sent you some shirts as well yeah, they did here's one of them. how you like them yeah, it's nice this one tells you right here you know, live today. You know, uh, you know, it's about the moment. And um, I'm not wearing it because, uh, well, they must have been just thinking that I have a body like you, that I'm trim and slim, <laughs> and they sent me a medium. You know, so I'm going to have to get on my athletic greens for maybe a week, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and fast and just eat athletic greens for a week. <laughs> and then I'll be able to, I'll be able to, you know, be nice and comfortable in this shirt. But here it is. It's a nice shirt. It's got the right saying. I always say life is a fight. So um, I'm in. You know, I'm in with what they're doing. Uh, I'm in with them giving to help people, I think the more you help people, uh, the more you help yourself, to be honest. If we can make people around us better, we make ourselves better. So, uh, and, and I think we teach. We teach people how important it is to give, to, to support people, to look out for people uh, if, if you're in a position where you can do that. And there's always a way to do it. There's always a way to do it. It doesn't have to be monetarily. It, it can be just by listening to somebody, by spending time with somebody. You know, uh, I have a, a neighbor across the street who's in her 80s, and unfortunately her husband of, you know, 45, 50 years, so I'm not sure exactly what it was, but obviously they were married a long time. He passed away last year. And I went over there yesterday, knocked on her door, you know, just, just to just to say hey somebody's thinking about you you know because obviously she's alone and um loneliness can be you know it can be the most difficult thing in the world it can be a, like a disease to be honest with you uh and so i went over there and yeah you, you would have thought you know you would have thought i did something real special ken just knocking on her door and saying you okay um you know we're over here come over have a cup of tea you know it, it it makes a difference and like i said there's so many ways that you can improve somebody you can help somebody uh it doesn't have to be ready, writing a check or anything like that it could be like just asking somebody hey are you okay i'm thinking about you you know come over have a cup of tea so um well we always try to get with the right sponsors and i think we've done a good job and rob's done a good job with that we we don't say yes to everybody we want to know what the people are about, and um, these people are about the right thing. So we're glad to have them on board. Uh, they, you know, like I said, the the shirts that they say uh, they inspire, uh, they 
They look good, especially on you. Once I get my athletic greens in me for a week and stop eating, <laughs> I'll look uh, I'll look good. You'll see me in one of them, and hopefully I'll look good, but never as good as you. I, I could never run 10 miles. I know you ran 10 miles the other day. Uh, we were talking, and it was raining out. Uh, the rain did not. You're better than a postman. A postman don't even get to my house when it rains sometimes. <laughs> I mean, uh, but <laughs> you you get out there, you do your 10 miles when it's raining. You got a big race coming up at the end of the month, I believe. And uh, I just want to tell you, you know, and I'm sure all our fans out there would like to hear it, uh, that you you know that you're getting ready for this uh, world championship race, basically. Uh, they have different categories. Uh, you'll be going for your age group. Um, and just just tell the fans a little bit about it because I know they like to know about that. Yeah, it's the uh, age group World Marathon Majors World Championships in uh, London, October 3rd. So, yeah, I've been running um, 80 to 100 miles a week, which in this heat in Tennessee is insane. I did 20 miles yesterday. You better yesterday. cut down a little bit. I'm, I'm telling you, with that humidity, <laughs> you, you know, it's, I mean, when, when we box, when we spar, when I have uh, fighters in the camp sparring, if they're sparring with three fresh guys, I'll cut the rounds down because I'll say that, like, that's I'll use an arbitrary number, but eight rounds with three fresh guys is like doing 11, 12 rounds. You know, there's there's a new math. Yeah. There's a you have to know the business. You have to know what you're involved in, obviously. And there's yep. there is a certain metric uh, to whatever it is that you do. And in my business, you know, you do eight rounds with three fresh guys, you might as well have done 11, 12 rounds somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, obviously depending on the pace. But it makes a difference because you're doing it with fresh guys. When you're running your X amount of miles and you're running in that humidity, well, if you're running, uh, again, I use an arbitrary number, if you're running eight miles in that humidity, that can equate into 12 rounds, you know, uh, in, in a normal, cooler environment. So just be careful with that. I know you're, you're cognizant of all those things. I know with uh, eating and, you know, the hydration and you do everything, obviously, in a very well-informed way. But just, just be careful because I know you're a maniac and, and <laughs> you want to win. And, and I yeah, want I you to win. win. And I want you to win. And all our fans want you to win. And I know that our English uh, brothers and sisters over there are all going to show up and they're going to be rooting. <laughs> they're probably going to have signs up, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> the fight. Uh, go, you know, go, go, Ken. Let's go, Ken, you know. And, um... <laughs> Don't, you know, don't bust their chops when, you know, when they come up and they pat you on the back and they're all supporting you. Don't bust their chops about any of the dart <laughs> stuff and snooker and, you know, you know, don't bust their chops about the crumpets that are better with butter. You know, <laughs> just just tell them that you love them and that I love them. I'm looking forward to seeing them all in October. I'm sure they're looking forward to seeing you. Well, listen, Teddy. We had a big pay-per-view fight. Everyone was looking forward to it. Last-minute replacement for Pacquiao. We had your Danis Ugas. Ugas scores the massive upset. A massive upset. Uh, wins it handily. I'm curious to hear if you thought that Pacquiao looked old or Ugas just looked awesome or a combination thereof. Ugas seemed to me to have a very awkward style, like that little lean over. He's tall, but he's leaning over, and his, the right hand couldn't miss. I don't think he, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Pacquiao might have been offended if he didn't get hit with one of them. Every single one was on the money. Um, how'd you like it? And what'd you think? Was it, did Pacquiao look old or did Ugas just look really good? Yeah, first of all, I don't think it was a massive upset. And I'll tell you why. And I understand some people might disagree with me and I understand where you're coming from. For me, it's not. When, you, when you're beaten as, as iconic as Pacquiao is, when you get a win over a 42-year-old, um, and he's a special 42-year-old, but he's 42 years old, and when you're talking about a guy who was a bronze medalist, Ugas, uh, Ugas was a bronze medalist, so he had probably two, 300 amateur fights. Uh, so you're talking about a thoroughbred uh, in that way. You're, you're talking about an elite 
athlete and elite fighter that uh, he's from the Cuban National Olympic team. Uh, they're the best amateur boxing team in the world. And, and, and he had a world title. You know, he had Pacquiao's world title. When you're talking about a fighter of that kind of pedigree, of Ugas, for me, you know, he he can fight top guys, even uh, iconic guys like like Manny Pacquiao, especially when they're 42 years old. And obviously, he's you know, it's not an impossibility that he can that he can win a fight. I we always do full disclosure. I picked Pacquiao to win a fight. The reason why I picked Pacquiao. Is Styles. I thought that I saw the danger, but I also saw that, and and it came true. It, was, it came to fruition. Uh, again, I, I'm the first one to say I picked Pacquiao to win a decision. Am I shocked? No, because in my analysis of it, to you great people out there, and when we did our fight plan and. Other people that called me asking, different pundits out there call me asking me about my thoughts. The first thing was, Ugas is the kind of guy that can be outworked. He's he's a conservative guy. He's a sharpshooter. He's there's a reason why he lost to Porter. I thought he beat Porter technically. I, did I thought too. he won by one point or so. Yeah, I can. I thought he won that fight, but I saw what happened. I saw that. Porter kind of out hustled him, uh, outworked him, if you want to say, in a way, or conned him. And I'm taking nothing away from Porter. But he won rounds by conning him, by conning the judges, by moving to his left and using his jab. But they weren't laughing. They weren't landing. But they were they were being thrown. And he was still in moments where there was nothing really happening. And you're not supposed to really steal moments that way. It's supposed to come down, really, if you're going to purely judge a fight properly, which never happens in this sport, rarely, with, with the people that are out there doing it. But it's supposed to be about who's controlling the fight, who's landing the cleaner, more effective punches. And in that fight with Porter, Ugas was landing clean shots like to the body he was picking the spots he was counting with right hands uh, he was he was being what he is a counter puncher a conservative guy a sharpshooter and you gotta have the right judges you gotta have the right judges to appreciate it to see that and i thought that porter by using the jab and moving a little bit was enough for him to get a split decision uh and it was again because he's not a real active guy He's the kind of guy that can be outworked. He's the kind of guy that can be out hustled. He's the kind of guy you can steal rounds. And it was evident again. He he was outworked. I wasn't wrong. He was outworked. But it was more evident in this fight that he was also a sharpshooter, a counter puncher, did good body work. He was landing the more effective, cleaner shots. It was it was it was evident. And part of the reason why it was evident is because of the style of Pacquiao. Where number one, the physicality of Pacquiao. Pacquiao looked like the smaller guy. You know, he's he's not the naturally bigger guy. We understand that. Most of his fights or a lot of his fights he's not. And in this fight it was evident. It was very evident that Ugas was naturally bigger and stronger, more physical. You could see it. I mean, it showed right away. And with that physicality, with that size advantage, when he was able to catch him, he was able to move him. And it was able to put more effect. It was, it was almost like watching a movie with sound effects. Like it got your attention. Like uh, even even to some of these blind judges, you know, uh, really, uh, they couldn't, you know, even they couldn't miss it because even when Pacquiao was blocking the the right hands, which he blocked a lot of them, I I, I don't know. In all fairness, you know, he did block a lot of them. He got hit clean, but he blocked a lot of them. And but when he was blocking them, and you obviously if you're blocking it, it shouldn't count as a punch against you. I'm sure some of them did, 
because even when he was blocking them, they were moving him. They were knocking him off balance. And that's what I mean by the sound effects. That it, it, what Pacquiao was doing was more quiet. And, and Pacquiao was winning around, especially early, with his speed, his combinations, you know. And again, Ugas will allow that. He will allow you to outwork him. And Pacquiao outworked him. There's no arguing that. But Ugas' style, which I noted, even though I picked Pacquiao, I noted going in. I'll tell you a funny story. I got a call from a bunch of pundits uh, before the fight. Uh, some of them in the in the mediums of newspaper and um, websites, some of them television and websites too, uh, internet stuff. The word, if you remember, I, I, all of them was saying, oh, Ugas is aggressive, he's this, he's that. And I was like, no, he's not. No, he's not. He's a counterpuncher. But they had it in their head. I don't, I don't know how they do that. I mean, uh, I, it always makes me shake my head when some of these so-called pundits in this business, uh, some of their thoughts, like this, uh, they'll tell me a guy is uh, uh, a boxer, and I'll say, really? I, he, he, he don't look like that to me. He looks like an aggressive guy that is looking to you know, break it down, or, or they'll say, oh, he's uh, just an aggressive guy, and I'll look and I'll say, well, he looks like a counterpuncher to me. He looks, he doesn't really look, look just like a walking guy. And they were all saying, for the most part, that he's aggressive. Every one of them. I was seeing whatever I was reading. He's aggressive. Who I was talking to, he's aggressive. And I, I'm telling them, I, I don't know what guy you guys have been watching, but the guy I've been watching is really a counterpuncher. He's a thoughtful guy. He's a smart guy. Uh, he's a guy that is conservative and he can be outworked but he you know but he's also a guy that if the night is right for him he can be a handful because you know he'll, he'll pot shot the crap out of you he'll sniper the hell out of you you know but if he doesn't do it in enough abundance he could he could lose a decision and um so next thing i i see close to the fight i see people suddenly changing a little direction and i hear it even on the broadcast oh yeah he's 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 a counter puncher i was like where where did that change come from i'll tell you where did that change come from um not that i'm uh, but all i know is people in all the mediums out there tell me that everyone which we we're blessed and we we appreciate but everyone, forget about the fans who we appreciate more than anyone, but that all the people in the industry watch this show. They all, I mean, I've had producers tell me that, directors tell me that, you know, uh, newspaper people tell me that, uh, whatever. And they watch the show. And I was like, kind of like, I was just like laughing a little bit, saying, now all of a sudden they. You know, I'm hearing that they, he's a counterpuncher when some of these same people had told me that, you know, he's he's basically a walking guy. And but at the end of the day, they they got it. And I think everyone got it finally, um, after they saw what he did. And he did it at a high level. Um I mean, it's, first of all, he wasn't a last-minute replacement in a traditional sense, in a real sense. Yeah, he replaced Spence, but he was on the undercard to defend his title on the undercard anyway. So he was training for the fight. So he wasn't a last-minute replacement, which some people kept saying. Oh, he's a last-minute re No, not really. Yeah, he's replacing Spence, but... A last-minute replacement in the way that we think of it is a guy that got called sitting on his couch and gets the call two weeks before, 10 days before, a week before, whatever. And, hey, uh, we had a fallout. You want this fight. And he's, you know, he's got to get in the gym and there's only so much you can do at that point if, if you've been sitting on the couch. So that wasn't the case here. This is a guy who was preparing for that date to be ready for that date, to fight.
he just had to now prepare obviously to fight an iconic guy and that that wasn't hard to do because you got a kid who never made big money you got a kid who had a bronze medal which you, you know I, I remember when I did four Olympics and all the great Cuban fighters uh, were winning all the gold medals and I also remember the sadness of seeing them sell their medals to people from other countries right there in the Olympics yeah it's a real thing real thing Right there, selling their medals for fifteen hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, thousand dollars, whatever it was that they could get, so that they could buy things that they didn't have money to buy. I remember one of them selling, one of them selling his gold medal, so he could buy toys for his. I think it was a four or five year old son for his birthday party that he could. Uh, he wanted to buy. He wanted to buy. I think one of them wanted to buy a bicycle, but whatever it was, it was for a birthday party for one of their child's children. And can you imagine? You work your whole life. You really, literally, blood. I mean, blood, sweat, and tears. You put in everything and to win a gold medal, one of the greatest things you can win, one of the greatest accomplishments out there, and you got to sell it so you can buy toys for your kid for the birthday because of the country you live in that you know I mean it's it, it, again it's a reminder of how fortunate we are to live in this country but the the point I make is besides everything else I'm breaking down here you had a hungry fighter a truly hungry fighter you know the, like like they would say you can't eat with those bronze medals and those silver medals and those gold medals they look nice but they ain't going to put food on the table. He got a chance coming from that environment, coming from that place. He got a chance now to make money, to do something that he never had a chance to really do to that level. He was hungry. And he knew what was there. And he wasn't going to... And he and it showed. It showed with his attitude. It showed with you know, his whole demeanor, his whole body language. All night. Forget about the counterpunching. That's important to note that part of it, that mental part, that emotional part of it, that this guy knew the opportunity and he wasn't going to let it freaking slip by. He wasn't. And so all of that went into it. I remember breaking it down before the fight, saying that Ugas is a sharpshooter. He can have... He can have success to the body. He's a good body puncher. He should go to the body when we talked about it, when we did our when we when we did our new fight plan. We put out the fight plan, and I hope the people enjoyed it, of what me and Ken had done for the Spence fight, Spence and Pacquiao. But then I did an addition on it, talking for about eight, eight, nine minutes about him fighting Ugas. Where you know we we made obviously uh, we improvised it we I changed it uh, we you know I I did the breakdown of what now Pacquiao had to do with Ugas and what Ugas had to do and of course we couldn't illustrate it but I I talked it for about eight nine minutes and during that talk and during that breakdown I talked about both sides. I talked about how Pacquiao would have opportunities to outwork Ugas because he is so conservative. He is a sharpshooter. He doesn't waste anything. He's like the guy I would make jokes that your grandmother would love or your mother would love that he'd go to the dinner table and nothing would be wasted. He wouldn't be leaving food on a plate. And, and that's him. He doesn't throw punches if you don't think they're going to land. So he's not gonna. He's not just gonna be chucking punches to catch the eyes of the officials. And again, one of the reasons why I picked against him, because there was a good possibility he could get outworked, and he got outworked. But the style worked for him perfectly, because a counter puncher is at his best when he's got someone coming forward. He needs help. He needs help, just like Fred Astaire, the great dancer, needed Ginger Rogers as a dance partner, to really, really look great. You know, Ali needed Frazier. Frazier needed Ali, you know, uh, to, to really be sensational. 
And a counter puncher needs an aggressive guy. Pacquiao is still aggressive. He comes at you. And so I talked about how basically three things would work for Ugas. Body work should be there because it will slow down the older Pacquiao, take his wheels away, slow him down a little bit. His engine runs fast. Slow that engine down. Other thing is I talked about that it was mandatory. And in the Spence breakdown, I talked about it. If Spence was going to fight him, when we had originally thought he was fighting him, I said the key was to jab. The key was to jab. A lot of people didn't think that going in. Oh, no, it's about this. No, it's to jab. Because that will stabilize Pacquiao on the outside and not let him get that rhythm going. It'll it, uh, break up that rhythm. It'll uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, disjoint him a little bit. It's so important to use that jab. And against the South Pole, a lot of people don't because it's a little more difficult to land it. But you still should use it. You still should use it because it's still going to have the effect, the impact that it needs to have. It's it's going to control him on the outside. It's, it's gonna it's gonna keep him where you want to keep him. It, again, it's gonna destroy him. It's it's gonna disrupt his rhythm. Very important. Very important. Matter of fact, maybe the most important thing. And so I had said. Ugas needs to go to the body, he needs to use the jab, and he needs to throw right hands. We understand. I used to say it all the time when I was broadcasting the fights at ringside. I would always say the right hand is the southpaw killer. They land against southpaws. But they definitely, all you had to do was watch the Mayweather fight. Lead right hands, lead right hands, not even off the jab. Lead right hands, naked right hands uh, can be effective for Pacquiao. Uh, they were Mayweather won that fight with lead right hands. He kept timing him with right hands all night long, and Pacquiao in his corner never had an answer. They never made an adjustment ever in that whole night. And so going into this fight, I had said body work, the jab, four guys to win, and right hands, and. That was there all night. Now, for Pacquiao, well, Pacquiao, obviously, you know that saying, you can't talk, teach an old dog new tricks. You're going to go with what you go with. Well, it always worked. I mean, for the most part. You know, his speed, his quickness, his ability to close the gap, to get in, get out, get in, get out. Um, the difference was when he was coming in, he didn't look he didn't look noticeably slower. He didn't. I'd be making it up if I said, Oh yeah, you know, he was slow and that's why, you know, I, I, my pick didn't come true. Um, no. He didn't look notice he no, he didn't. He was he was coming in against his southpaw who obviously this is this is how he makes a living, Ugas. So the style was a problem. Uh it was suited for a guy like Pacquiao to that extent that he's going to be giving him something to counter. But the big thing in this fight was Manny had his moments where he outscored him, where he landed combinations, he got out. But the biggest thing that I think was the difference, and a lot of people's eyebrows are going to go up when I say this, but again, we I say what I believe to be the truth from my almost 50 years of experience. I, I don't say anything else. I don't worry about what someone's going to think, what someone's going to... I don't, because I can't let that get in the way of putting forward what I think I need to put forward to do my job. How many times do you watch a football game where you say at the end of the game, I know my son, who's a... You know, he's the director of scouting, the assistant director of scouting for the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, and he's real good at what he does. I know a lot of times he'd tell me that the coach made a difference on the other side. He outcoached that team. And sometimes that coach would be Ken's favorite coach, B Bill Belichick. How many times Bill Belichick, really, really, it was a close game. And at the end, you know, you, you even hear the commentators, if they're honest about it, and if they're real commentators, they'll say, 
Belichick outcoached this guy. You know, he, he outcoached him, or whatever coach it is. Belichick's not the only smart coach out there, obviously. John Gruden. I remember my son told me in a couple games last year, he said, Dad, Gruden outcoached the guy. Gruden outcoached the guy. So I think that Ugas' this guy outcoached Pacquiao's guy. And I know a lot of people go, oh, uh, uh, go ahead, do it. Do whatever you got to do. You know, if you got to get a paper bag and put it over your mouth and your nose and breathe in and out go a couple times, that's going to help you calm down. Go ahead, do that too. I'll wait until you're finished. Go ahead. All right, good. You got that? Um, listen, it comes down to the fighters in the ring. I get it. I get it. I give all the credit in the world to Ugas. I said that. And he was, uh, his style was perfect uh, to have a chance in his fight. And he executed. He executed brilliantly. He went to the body, slowed him down. You know, he threw, he threw uh, lead right hands and he caught him. He, uh, you know, he used a jab to disrupt the rhythm of Pacquiao and to control him on the outside, not let him do what he wanted and not let him go in and out, uh, disrupted him. Beautiful, beautiful. He was prepared. His coach had him prepared perfectly. Everything I said, there's a point why I'm going over this. The re everything I said, it's not to show off. It's to make a point. Everything I said, and all you have to do is watch the fight plan that I said that Ugas needed to do, he did. Not because I, I was right, because his coach understood that that's what he needed to do to have the best chance to win. His coach, they were, they were brilliantly prepared. Every, everything that had to be done, they were ready to do it, and they did it. They went to the body. They used the jab. They threw the right hand. Everything. There was, the blueprint was there. If you know anything about the sport, you knew in the Mayweather fight that he got hit with right hands. You knew that a guy who uses his legs, you should go downstairs, put water in the basement, you know, take the air out of the tires a little bit. You know that when a guy's aggressive coming at you, that you're going to, it's in your wheelhouse. You know that when a guy has got that kind of kinetic energy, you should use your jab just to slow it down and, and not think only of power punches. You have to know that if you're in this business at the level you're supposed to be to help a fighter. And his trainer knew that. Pacquiao didn't know what he needed to know. He even admitted it in the interview. He said, I wasn't prepared for some of these things. I, I, he, did, did he surprise you, the commentator said. He said, yeah, I, I, there were certain things I wasn't ready for, certain things that, you know, I, uh, that, that, Basically, I forget exactly his wording of it, but basically caught him unprepared. He shouldn't be caught unprepared at this level. It shouldn't happen. He should have, Teddy, what should he have done? All right, I answer you. He should have, he should have used feints instead of just walking in you know, to the propeller of the plane, as I used to say when I was breaking fights down on, you know, at, at ringside. He should have fainted first. And drew the counter. Then came in safely. He should have fainted and went in the side door instead of the front door. Go in the side door instead of coming in straight. Now listen, at 42, maybe his legs didn't allow so much of that. All right. I'm, I'm, see that? I'm, I'm taking that into account. So use the faint just then, just to get the counter out of the way. So when you come in, you don't walk into something. So he... He wasn't prepared the way Ugas was prepared. Ugas was prepared for what Pacquiao had. Pacquiao wasn't prepared for what Ugas had. And he should have been. He should have been. I know it was the last minute of it, but he had the same amount of time to get ready and his team as Ugas did to get ready with the adjustment to him. The same. And they did it. He didn't do it. Him and his coach didn't do it. It didn't get done. And because it's, it's not me. I'm, I just point these things out that a lot of people don't because they don't know, they don't want it, they're afraid to, they don't want to make an enemy, they don't want to get nobody upset. I, I don't, I, I'm just doing what has to be done so the fans can uh, hopefully appreciate what they need to, they get the information they need to appreciate what, what happened and why it happened to the best degree as possible. That's my job. And 
Pat, the other thing that he didn't do, you got to make adjustments even during a fight. The one major one that Pacquiao never made that really killed him, that really hurt him, and the commentators never mention this, but I saw it right away. He didn't judge distance well, Ken. He, he kept stopping, whether it was at the beginning when he was going to get started, he stood in front at the wrong distance and he got caught with lead right hands. Or when he got finished his action, he stepped out, he stepped out straight out in front of Ugas, but too close. He should have went out six inches more. If he went out six inches more, he would have missed those right hands. He would have. He would have. But he, at the, when he initiated the action, he waited in front and he got caught waiting in front because he was too close. He was too close. He misjudged the range, the distance of where Ugas' punches could reach. And he wasn't prepared for it. Okay, one round. Two rounds. I'm going to go nuts. Three rounds. It happens. But it can't happen for 12 rounds. You have to make that a try. Bill Belichick at halftime, back to that point. They go in. They're losing. How many times have you seen it, Ken? How many times have you seen it? Your team up there, they go in at halftime losing. Adjustment gets made. They're a different team the second half. All of a sudden, the things that were working the first half ain't working no more. They ain't working no more. Why? The coach made an adjustment. Against Atlanta in the Super Bowl, 28-3. They were down. There it is. There it is, Ken. And, and there was no adjustment. I know there's not a halftime, but there's a minute every round there's a halftime. That's the halftime in boxing. Every round, that minute in between rounds when you go to your corner, that's the halftime. And nobody told him to, hey, you got to get a little further out. You're stopping too close. You got to start from a little farther out. When you get done, your exchanges and you come out, come out farther. You're not coming out far enough. You're, you're, you're getting caught because your distance is wrong. So for me, the main thing was that. It was also that he didn't give angles. Maybe his legs didn't allow him to go in and out as much or to go to the side. Maybe the 42-year-old legs didn't allow him as much. The upper body looked fine. His punches, his output of punches, his combinations, he looked sharp. He looked fast. He looked, he, he looked good. He did. And I'm going to say I'm taking nothing away from Ugas. You asked me a good question at the top. You said, was it because... He's not Manny Pacquiao anymore because he's 42. Listen, you don't need Teddy Atlas to tell you that at 42, he's not the Pacquiao he was at, you know, 32 or at, you know, 22, God, if you want to go that far back, whatever, or at 28 or at 30, whatever. But he was still terrific. Pacquiao was, I thought he was terrific. He, he showed the heart that Pacquiao always shows, even though he got caught these punches by a bigger guy uh, and a really good, accurate counterpuncher. That's what Ugas is. Like I said, he don't waste nothing. He's an accurate sharpshooter. You know, he's a, he's, a, he's a sniper. And he knew what he had to do. And he knew what his opportunities and chances, they were prepared for that. And he, was, he executed there were plenty of rounds, especially early, that I thought Manny won. I thought it was a close fight. I thought it was a close fight. But I'm not going to argue it because the clean punches, for the most part, go to the advantage of Ugas on that side. But I thought Manny, to your question at the top, I thought Manny was terrific. I'm telling you, I don't care what people's. I thought it's going to be too easy to say he's 42. Yeah, he is 42. There's no doubt about it. But... The other guy, the other guy in this case, just fought the right fight, whether he was 22, 28, 32, 42. The guy fought the right fight. And you got to give him credit for that. He did the right things for what was going to be in front of him. And Pacquiao, I thought, I thought, I thought he looked terrific. I mean, again, maybe a little less in and out, maybe less going to the side, but he still did it. Maybe not as consistently, um, 
but his hand speed was there. His combinations were sharp. Uh, I, I tell you, his heart, as always, was was huge. I, I he's special. If anything, this didn't take away f- for me. This didn't take away in any way the legacy or any of that f- for Pacquiao. If and some, it enhanced it. Yeah, that's right. He lost, and I think it enhanced him in a way that this guy is special. To, to perform at that level with a top guy, a top guy at that level, wow. If there was any doubt about how special Pacquiao was, that fight should remove it. Yeah, I know some people are going to say, I can't believe he's, yeah, in a loss. Yeah, at 42. You got to be damn special to perform at that level the way he did. I thought he was tremendous. I thought so was Ugas. Uh, but I thought Pacquiao, I, I I know he got marked up, he got caught more, but to do it under the circumstances, and I'll say that word again, under the circumstances, to perform the way he did, bravo. I just applaud him as the special, special, special fighter that he deserves to be applauded to, for. He he was tremendous. And... um. And Ugas, Ugas was, was tremendous. And uh, as I said, I, I think that some of the blame has to go uh, to, you know, it has to be shared. When you have a victory, you share it. When I, when I have a fighter loses, I have to take, and I do, and I do. I have to take uh, some of the responsibility. When he wins, they give me some whether they deserve it or not. When he loses, I got to take some of it too. And I think that in this case, you know, uh, just like I thought when he fought Mayweather, he there was no adjustments made in that fight. All night long, right hands were landing uh, against Pacquiao. And again, the, the corner's there, the trainer's there for a reason. And I, I just didn't see the adjustment. I didn't see any adjustment. I didn't see the preparation going in there. You didn't know. If I knew, doing it on a podcast, that this guy's a counterpuncher, this guy's going to look to land right hands, this guy's going to look to go to the body, this guy's going to look to use the jab. You're not, you're, you're not going to, you're fighting, and you aren't going to be prepared for that? I mean, how's that possible? How, how's that possible? I mean, that's your job. So I just thought that the the other side outcoached him. Obviously, the fighter uh, outfought him in in the way that he did, and they got a deserve very deserved it, huge win. Um, I do I think Pacquiao's done. That's up to him. That's up to him. But uh, I don't think he's done. If he don't want to be done, not not uh, he he looked good. Um, you know, the funny thing, in some ways, it turned out to be a more difficult opponent maybe than Spence. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's, I know it sounds crazy, but, um, because Spence, listen, Spence would have used his jab. That would have been a problem. And I said that in, in our fight plan for the people that saw it. That, that would have been, because that's what you got to do with Pacquiao. A lot of people didn't know that, but I'm, I'm sure Spence would have done that because Spence did it with Garcia, with Mikey Garcia. He used that jab. He's supposed to be a sick and destroy guy, Spence, but he's more than that. He's a smart guy. He's a guy that, that is uh, sophisticated, a guy that's polished, a guy that uses his jab, you know, the southpaw jab, uh, you know, uh, and and knows how to counter punch too. But this guy was a pure counter puncher. And in some ways, maybe this style in, in its own right, because who knows if Pacquiao could have gotten Spence to buy in to being only the bigger, stronger, more aggressive guy, which a lot of people, that's how they were handicapping that fight. Oh, he's too big. He's too aggressive. You know, he's too strong. If, if Pacquiao could have got Spence to buy into that, hey, Pacquiao could have counterpunched. He could have moved to the side. He could have went in and out. Eh, who knows? Who knows? Then again, there'll be people as they're listening to me saying, hey, if Ugas did that, Spence would have done more. Hey, I'm not going to fight with you. I'm not going to argue with you. 
but I am going to remind you that it's styles have a lot to do with what happens in that ring. And um, Spencer's style is different. First of all, he's a southpaw. Second of all, he's known for being aggressive, much more than Ugas. So it, it would have been a, a different look. Yeah, I know how good Spence is. But I also know that, listen, I hope he heals. I hope the detached retina heals and he'll be okay and he can fight again if that's what he wants to do. I, I, I send my thoughts and prayers out that that, that would be the case for Spence. Um, but there were reports, and maybe it had to do with the eye already, but there had been reports that I talked to a few people that he wasn't looking good in camp. He was getting hit a lot, uh, Spence. Now, again, that may have been attached to the fact that he already detached his retina and maybe it wasn't noticed yet. It wasn't, you know, understood yet. But it turns out uh, that, you know, fate, whatever you believe in, uh, had its hand in here. It wasn't meant to be. It was meant for Ugas to get the fight, as it turns out. And what happened, happened. Well, it certainly was an entertaining fight. And, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where Manny goes from here. Um, there, was another, there was another entertaining card, though, over on ESPN. They had the uh, UFC fight night, Jared Cannonier versus Cal Kelvin Gastelum. And there were a couple interesting fights on the undercard, one of them being uh, Ignacio Bahamedes against Roosevelt Roberts. Uh, it, only interesting in the fact that... Um, there was an incredible wheel kick at the end to uh, to stop the fight, and I was wanted to get your thoughts in the uh, not only the kick but the setup there. I know you got a chance to look at it, but what were your thoughts on that one? It was sensational. Obviously, his athleticism, uh, his agility. The thing that I that I looked at because I look at the whole picture, they're up against the cage, and the wheel kick was. There was about six seconds left in a in a yep. fight in the third round in the fight, and Bahamondas lands an elbow, and maybe that elbow uh, definitely affected Roberts. Maybe it impacted him more than than you would know. It disoriented him because he goes out towards the towards the ring away from the cage towards the center of the ring, and Bahamondas he cuts the ring down. He, he goes over to keep him in front of him. He slides over parallel. And he cuts the ring down. And he's in the southpaw stance. He switches stance to the orthodox stance. And then, for me, that did something. That had an effect. Because by switching from southpaw to orthodox, he made Roberts take note. He made Roberts see the switch. And when... Roberts saw the switch. Maybe he was more thinking that a punch is coming because why else would a guy switch from southpaw to orthodox? So he switches right in front of him, Ken. Southpaw, see, I look at the little intricacies. I look at how, I don't think accidents happen in a ring. I think they happen because they're set up, because of some kind of cerebral stuff going on sometimes genius stuff, where sometimes innate, instinctual stuff, where the guy sets it up. And so he goes, he cuts the ring down, Bahamondas. He gets him in front of him. He switches from Southpaw to Orthodox. During that switch, I wonder how much that impacted Roberts, that Roberts started thinking there's a punch coming. Because, you know... Why else would he make this switch? So he does that, and then in such a incredibly, just beautifully, just so smooth, so smooth, so graceful, without any, just seamless, he does the wheel kick, and he catches them clean. But the reason why I think something happened before that, whether it was partly the elbow on a on a cage early uh, two seconds earlier or it was him switching from 
Southpaw to Orthodox that kind of got his eyes to look at maybe something coming from a punch now because he froze. It was incredible. I mean, to the credit of Baramondas, yeah, he goes and, you know, he does this seamless, smooth execution of a wheel kick, but Roberts just looked like a deer in headlights. Like he was just frozen there. And to me, there has to be an answer to that. It has to be connected to either what happened in the cage with the elbow or the changing from southpaw to orthodox just disoriented him, got his mind looking at something else rather than what was coming. And again, beautiful execution by Baha Mondes. Uh, you don't get too many of those sensational knockouts whether it's by a foot or whether it's by a punch that was one of them that was one of those moments and it's attached to more than just explosiveness and power it's attached to execution it's attached to technique it's attached to you know talent ability his how graceful he was how quick he was how balanced he was all of that but it's also attached to how he set it up. Yeah. How how smart he was um, to set that up. So I, 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 I like to give credit in all the dimensions if those dimensions are there. Yeah. I, I like to make sure they don't get left out. And it was it was pretty damn good. Yeah. One of the other fights that I know you had some thoughts on from the undercard, I think from the prelims, Austin Lingo versus Luis Saldana. Uh, Lingo won a, got the decision over Saldana, and I know you had some, like I said, I know you had some thoughts on that one. What'd you see in that one, and what'd you find, what would what, you see so interesting? Yeah, and I was tweeting, by the way, you tweet birds <laughs> out there. You, uh, we, we, I was tweeting out there. Rob was getting them up, and we were getting a pretty darn good response to the UFC and uh, also to the Pacquiao later on we gotta but, make sure we give rob extra credit by the way because i know he was at a concert in uh colorado i think that's where i saw him so credit to rob for multitasking well he always does that i i always make his life miserable on saturday nights <laughs> you know i mean that's just what i do i mean you know and god bless his fiance soon to be his wife you know that yeah. uh you know and i hope he doesn't get married on a saturday night and thank goodness for distance that she can't like throw something at me, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, don't get married us <laughs> on a Saturday night. Um, but he's always there for me. Uh, usually it's in a restaurant, the poor guy, you know, <laughs> where they're, they're having a nice romantic dinner and all of a sudden, uh, is that Teddy again? <laughs> um, yeah, I have to put up a tweet. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, but I I appreciate him and the fans appreciate I'm sure that we I'm able to get him up because of the help from Rob I I thought that you know Lingo wound up winning the decision Saldana was faster I tweeted early that Lingo was going to need to jab to his chest or something just to kind of like the Pacquiao fight um, with Ugas, that he was going to have to do the same thing Ugas did to stabilize uh, Saldana, who, as I said, was faster and, and more dimensional, quite frankly. And I think it speaks to something I talk about, where the guy could be more talented, if you want to call it that, faster, uh, more dimensional, uh, because he, he Saldana was, was that kind of guy, that kind of athlete. Um, but there's a there's another talent, um, and Lingo had his talents, but he, there's also a talent that I always talk about that's not as eye catching as speed, you know, and, and quickness. It's not it does it doesn't have that eye candy to it. But it's the talent of being steady, of just being real solid and steady. So it's it's a damn good talent. It's a damn good talent. Yeah. Lingo came, you know, he showed that talent. And I remember tweeting afterwards. Um, I, I, Matter of fact, after the first round, I remember tweeting to Rob where timing, 
again, very similar to the Ugas Pacquiao fight. Part of with all the speed that Pacquiao had, timing can negate speed. Timing can beat speed. And Ugas understood that. And he used timing to beat Pacquiao, to to take advantage of his aggression. Um, not to get uh frazzled or intimidated by the speed. And the speed was there. It was still there at 42. But knowing that he could time him with all that experience from the amateurs that I described that Ugas had, he knew that he could he wouldn't get frazzled. He didn't have to panic. That yeah, the other guy's gonna outspeed him, but he didn't have to match his speed. He could time the speed. And he did. And that's what I had tweeted to Rob when before the second round that I felt I felt that Lingo needed to start timing. Uh, you know, that again that timing can beat speed. And he needed to do that uh, in the second round. And he did. He, he did that. I thought he did it beautifully. Where in the second round, I believe it was the second round, where Lingo, again, showed that ability to, to time Saldano. And he did a magnificent job of it, grabbing that round. And um, in the third round, it was a close fight. It was a great fight. It was a really close, terrific fight. And in the third round, what might have really captured it for Lingo was dropping Saldana with a body shot. And the interesting thing for me, Ken, was it was a jab to the body. Yeah. Um, because I, I oft, you see it often in boxing where... A lot of people don't think a jab is, you know, a consequential punch. They think it's for defense, to set up the power punches, to keep a guy off you, to control range, to get range. It's, it is for all those things. But it can be consequential. If you land it clean, if it's a good jab from the shoulder, snappy. How many times have you seen fighters drop guys? Drop guys unexpectedly with a jab. Part of it is it gets there quicker because it's the lead hand. And it can land unexpectedly. And when you're doing something unexpected, you can have, you know, you can have more impact, greater results. And if it lands clean, it's it's all about where it lands. So this was really interesting because here's the jab again that's supposed to be for all the other things, not of consequence. How often do you see, you don't see a jab dropping a guy every day to the chin, but how often do you see a jab dropping a guy to the body? Not too often. Yeah. Not too often. And again, the jab, the unexpectedness of it, the form, the, the, where it landed, it, it got that result. Uh, it, was, it, it got that result. The, the little lousy jab. The little lousy jab that a lot of people say, ah, yeah, you know, you, you got to look for a power punch to turn the fight around. Uh, sometimes the only thing you have to look for is what's right. And what's right often is the jab, that it, it is the right way to go. It will start things. And in this case, it, it got a knockdown to the body for, for Lingo and maybe, maybe uh, put the fight in, a, you know, in his court uh, with that. But it was a good fight. It was an interesting fight. And uh, very, very, very competitive. Yeah, UFC rarely disappoints. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on before we get to the uh, upcoming fights this weekend is uh, <laughs> the controversy with uh, the professor Michael Fox and his win over... Um, Gabe Mastry that was never recognized by the WBA. Well, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for them to rob once. They found a way. You got to give them credit. Listen, give the WBA credit. Ken, Ken, give them credit here. You know, that they could be creative enough, hungry enough, greedy enough, whatever, um, where they found a way to rob Fox twice and make it look like they were doing something good. Yep. <laughs> that's that's not easy. Yep. They uh they robbed him of the victory and now they're going to charge him $10,000 to file a protest. Can you imagine 
there's these this is like next level corruption i can imagine it's it's called boxing it's called these organizations you know there's a reason why i told you i named them wbas we be asking wbe we be collecting and ibf i be felonious i mean i mean that's the real call that is that's that's called as it is you know uh, like Howard Cosell, the great late Howard Cosell used to say, people hated him, people loved him. Either way, they paid attention. And he used to say, telling it like it is. Howard Cosell. <laughs> and uh, we're just telling it like it is, baby. Um, you got to give him credit. Give give the WBA credit. They they robbed the guy. Now they turn around. And because of the pressure put on him with everybody being up in arms and everything else a little bit, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give a rematch. Okay, we'll give a rematch. Uh, and, and what do they do? They charge him 10000 <laughs> I can't even say without laughing. Ten thousand dollars. I don't think that the fa- outside of the hardcore fans. I don't think most people recognize the level of corruption that they would have the balls to ask for ten thousand dollars from a kid who was a last minute replacement. I'd love to know what he even got paid for the fight. It couldn't be much more than ten thousand. And if it was, after he's done paying his manager and everyone else and his promoter and his trainers, it was like, probably more than that. But still, your point is well taken. Ten thousand to be a huge yeah. percentage of it, either way. It's crazy. Oh my good. Oh my goodness. I mean, it's ludicrous. Just real quick to go back on this Pacquiao fight and make a point that we, you kind of stirred my cobwebs a little bit by talking about this stuff with the organizations, the alphabet organizations, and you know the stuff and why they do it, how they do it. Let's remember now. A lot of people that are uninitiated with how deep this stuff runs and how it really works how corrupt it is. Um, a lot of people probably would have thought Pacquiao being a money maker because we always say follow the money. Uh, a lot of people probably thought, and I, and I bet you I'm hitting on something here, probably thought that if it was a relatively close fight, Pacquiao would get it. And you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong in this case because that title initially belonged to Pacquiao. He won it in the ring against Thurman. That, that belonged to him. And then when he didn't defend his title, they stripped him of it and they gave it to Ugas, you know, they being the WBA. Now, they didn't do that. He, he wasn't active enough, they said. But they didn't do that same thing to Thurman. Thurman was one of their guys. He's, you know, he's with PPC, you know, and, um, and Heyman does a hell of a good job. You know, protecting his fighters. He's he's strong out there with certain organizations. Obviously, he's got to deal with Fox. He's the guy. He's the man. And, and he does a hell of a job, and he takes care of his fighters. He does. So Pacquiao wasn't necessarily one of his guys. You know, he came over there, made a deal, you know. But he wasn't, you know, he wasn't really one of the guys that was there in a permanent way that the other guys are. I'm, I'm saying it in a very loose, easy, digestible, without making it complex, because I could go into all kinds of other things, and it, I, I wouldn't want to do that. It's, it'd be too much f- f- to put people through that. So, again, Thurman, they didn't strip. But Pacquiao, they said he was inactive, they stripped. And they gave it to Ugas, Ugas was rated at a certain, you know, I forget exactly where he was rated, if he was number one or number two, whatever. So they gave it to him. But he's, Ugas is there with PBC. I wonder how many people were thinking after that fight, I'm even wondering if you were, Ken, a little bit, how many people out there were thinking, hey, this fight's close enough, I wonder how the scores are going to go, if Pacquiao's going to get it. And not... And it didn't happen. And I think they got it right. I think they got it right. But to get it right so clearly, it was a little easier for anyone out there that thought that there would be a little favoritism or something pushed Pacquiao's way because obviously he could make more money than Ugas. Um, But Ugas is with the right side. He's with the right side. I won't go more deeper than that. He's he's with the right guys, put it that way. Um, that's associated, you know, in the right way with the man who runs it over there. 
you know, with Heyman, who's obviously uh, got his strength with with the organizations and with certain ones more than others. Like, they all do. They all do. Aaron's got his place where he's stronger. Hearn's got his place where he's stronger. You know, they all do. Um, for the, You know, for the way that it works. But anyone who was shocked that Pacquiao didn't get more love, if you will, uh, with the pencil and the scorecards, there is no shock. In this case, yeah, it's still about the money. <laughs> Where that money's going. <laughs> Where, uh, In other words, Pacquiao can bring more of it, but that means... That means diddly squat if more of it might be somewhere else. <laughs> you know, well, uh, with a different network and a different promoter uh, who's not necessarily going to stay there. That's all. I just wanted to explain that, and I was just wondering how many people might have been a little surprised thinking, ah, Pacquiao is going to wind up getting a, one judge in his favor here. And um, and it happens. We're talking about the fight with that poor kid Fox. Come on. Why'd that happen? Why'd that happen? It didn't happen from him out pump because he was out punching Maestra all night. No, it didn't happen from that. <laughs> well, I was so eager to talk about Michael Fox that I jumped out of the UFC before we talked about, of course, the main event. Uh, Jared Cannon here gets a split decision over Calvin Gastelum. Apologies. Um, talk to me about the main event. How'd you like it? Yeah, no. Listen, it wasn't the thrill in Manila, but it was a, it was a, it was like UFC fights. They're always solid. They're competitive. They're well matched. They're properly matched. That's what Dana White does. You know, you, I mean, you, you fight tough, or you, or you get on, you know, you get your thumb out and you start doing this <laughs> on Interstate I ninety. <laughs> here, here, here! Come on, give me a ride. Give me a ride. Ken, we pull over? Give me a ride, please. I mean, that's what you do. That's the way it works in a UFC where they're going to be well, tough match fights. And it was another one. The thing, first thing that caught me, Gastelum, he's so tough. He's got a granite chin. I mean, here's a guy who gets hit an elbow. He gets hit a knee on the chin. And then he gets dropped by a right hook. And when he got dropped by the right hook, he, he, he looked like a jack-in-the-box. I mean, he went down, he popped right up. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, thought it was my, I thought it was my grandson's jack-in-the-box. I mean, pop, pop. Like, like he didn't even stay like, on the canvas for like a tenth of a second. I mean, this guy's getting hit knees on the chin, elbows on the chin, gets punched on the chin, he <laughs> dropped right off. What a chin. Uh, he's got a granite chin. And... So that's the first thing I have to say. The the rest of it, I I got to give Cannonier just a credit for fighting a disciplined, controlled. He controlled the pace. He he was he was under control all the time. He was calm. He was patient, but not too patient. He was active doing what he had to do but but in a calm mode in a deliberate mode in a consistent mode i mean this guy used his longer arms he's got a great reach a great reach first of all he came down in weight i mean he looked shredded oh my goodness this guy looked like i don't know what i mean the terminator i mean he and and, and he there's a reason for it. He came down from a higher weight. He probably dropped 20, 25 pounds. I don't know what the weight that he dropped, but I know it was somewhere in that neighborhood at least. And he comes down. It shows you his dedication. I love to see that. It shows you that he made an assessment of himself and said, I can be better at a lower weight. I can, make, I can be better at a lower weight. But it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of discipline. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice. But I can be better. And that's what he did. Not everyone does that. And a lot of people know they could be better, but they, they, don't, they don't hitch it up with what I just said. They don't hitch it up with doing it. They don't hitch it up with the discipline, the sacrifice that it's going to take. He did. He did. This guy's a monster. I love this guy. By the way, he's lost over he's he's lost over a hundred pounds. Oh my god. 
from his heaviest. He he obviously didn't lose 100 pounds from the last fight to this fight. I I get that. If he did that... Um, Since 2009, he was living in Anchorage, Alaska, doing maintenance on an air traffic control on air traffic control equipment uh, for the FAA, and uh, serving in the army, and was out of shape, and then got it together, and like now he just looks like a freak of nature. Yeah, I mean, give him the credit. You love to hear those stories. Yep. Like I said, I, I don't know if he lost 20, 25, 30 pounds from the last fight, the last weight class, whatever. But obviously just so the people understand what we're saying he didn't lose 100 pounds from his last fight he, he's lost 100 pounds from a point in his life when he started getting more dedicated correct. to taking care of himself correct yeah see if he lost 100 pounds from his last fight i i don't know i i like to hang out with him and <laughs> just uh see the see see some of the magic that this guy must have but he's got magic anyway because and the magic is within him it's within him uh just being determined enough to make that change to make that commitment i love him because he's a humble just a humble decent guy i mean afterwards when he talked he he is just i mean he's a kind of he'd be an ambassador for anything for ufc whatever because he he again he talks in such a decent humble respectful way how could you not root for a guy like this so he used he he's got really long arms he used it terrifically uh, to have an advantage on the outside he was the quicker guy the faster guy he was the more dimensional guy i already gave my my props to gastelum and i'll give more he's an aggressive guy he's a tough son of a gun granite chin but he's one dimensional yep and that's part of what wanted for Cannonier is that he he is quicker. He is he used those long arms. It's one thing to have long arms. It's another one to use it. All the time when I was calling him fights on ESPN, I said, yeah, this guy's taller, he's longer, but he don't know how to fight tall. He, he doesn't throw the punches to take advantage of those assets from the right place, from the right distance. Cannonier does. Cannonier does. And he used his length. He also used his versatility. Uh, as I said, Gastelum, tough, aggressive, strong, uh, everything. But he's one-dimensional. And Cannonier took advantage of that. He kept him off balance with some movement, controlled movement. He, he pot-shotted him at the right times with his reach. He set traps sometimes. He counter-punched beautifully. He sniped, you know, he, he he mixed it up and all along knowing exactly what he needed to do. Not to let this strong, tough Gastelum get into his wheelhouse. Yep. Oh, I love the way he switched from Southport to Orthodox so seamlessly, so smoothly, and so effectively on both sides. He was like Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle was a great switch hitter. Either side, he could hit with power and average. You don't see that too often uh, in boxing or MMA where guys switch and they can be effective, just as effective on either side. He was. He, he was so good at switching that I thought, for me, and I know that I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not an, I'm, not, I'm not royalty. I'm not close to it. I'm not an expert on MMA or UFC. I just know what I know about fighting. So I don't pretend to be anything like these great guys are that are in the sport that do the commentating. But for me, for this, for this uh, little, as my son would, my grandson would say, this little scoundrel <laughs> over here, you little scoundrel, you. Um, for this little peasant that I am in the MMA world, and I give all respect to them and appreciation that the fans allow me into their world, allow me, and that the, all those great commentators, they allow me into their world. I appreciate the hell out of that. Um, but for me, he's the best switch hitter I've ever seen Wow! in, in MMA. He's, I've never seen, and, and I love to hear from some of the people that would know better than me. I would love to hear their feedback. I would love to. But for me, I can only go by what I've seen. And, and you know, I've seen it the last few years, 
to a pretty high degree, but nothing, nothing. And I don't pretend it to be nothing compared to what these guys have seen. But for me, what I have seen, he's the best. He is the best at switch hitting that I've seen and being effective, equally effective on either side of the plate. Um, having said that, he used that brilliantly, again, to keep the strong Gastelum off balance because you could have a strong guy like a bull, but he needs to be set to be strong. He needs a little cooperation. Cannonier didn't give him any cooperation. He he didn't let him get set. He kept him off balance. Yeah. And as I said earlier, I love his. I just love his uh, his character. I, I, I now you spoke to me a little bit about it. He was in the army. Did you say? Yep. He was uh, so now it's it makes more sense. It makes more sense that those guys are very special. Those guys that go into the armed services and commit themselves to other people, commit themselves to the country. Uh, they're selfless. They're selfless, special people. They are. And um, it, so it makes sense that that's part of his background, that he's that kind of man, so humble, uh, so just just so gracious uh, and, and so damn good. <laughs> and so damn good in that cage. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about from last week, we mentioned uh, Nico Ali Walsh, uh, Muhammad Ali's grandson, made his professional boxing debut, and I know you wanted to uh, touch on that before we move on to the uh, upcoming fights. But uh, did you have a chance to watch his uh, pro debut? And uh, if so, what'd you think? Yeah, I, I looked at it because I got a call from Josh Peter. Peters from USA Today does a good job. I I promised the audience, our audience, that I would get back to them this week. What I saw, well, I mean, again, we're gonna we're gonna be the way we are. We're gonna be comprehensive about what we do. Uh, first, that's before I go into Ali's grandson performance. Let's go into who it was against. You know, it's only right. It's only fair, you know. And listen, before I even say this, this is the way it's done in boxing. You know, those those early fights are, are layups, slam dunks. Uh, you know, m- most most people fight, uh, especially if you have a promoter, especially if you have a name, especially if you have the ability to have it your way, so to speak, right? Um, and you have the power on your side. You have Ali's name. You have the power on your side. Most fighters in this business are brought up on a light diet, a light, very, very, very light liquid diet early on. You know, they're, they're not having anything that's going to give them agita or any kind of heartburn. It's very easy to, to digest. And so it's not uncommon that when you're building up a fighter in this business, if you got somebody behind you, they're going to get the benefit of, of a very soft diet. Okay, early on, and that's what Ali's grandson got. He he fought he fought a guy named Jordan Weeks. Uh, the the name Weeks is telling right there because <laughs> I guess you could figure it out. Uh, his record now is four and two. He's now been knocked out two times because Ali's grandson knocked him out, and then uh, he had been knocked out. Uh, previously, his other the guy who knocked him out in the, in his last fight was one in six. No, one six and one. Don't take that draw away from. Oh, him. sorry. Okay, uh, the combined record of his opponents that he's fought in his career is ten wins, forty losses, and two draws. Um, and as you said, his other KO loss, KO loss, was to a one six and one fighter. All right. So he wasn't in there. With Godzilla, right? Uh, so we've we made that clear. But you still have to get in there, and it's still a matter of what do you bring to the dance? What do you bring? What do you look like? How do you do it? Even when Tyson was knocking out these, uh, you know, the old times would call them tomato cans. But I, I don't want to call any fighter tomato can because if they get in the ring, they have enough heart to get in the ring. They deserve some respect. They get in the ring. Yeah, even if they don't do it at a good level or at a, a very successful level, they still got the guts to get in the ring. Most people don't have the guts to do that. Uh, so 
but Tyson early on was being given, obviously, you know, soft diet again. We'll stick with, we'll stick with that. And, but the key was how he was beating them, how he looked. It wasn't just that he was doing what he's supposed to do. It's how you look while you're doing it. So Ali's grandson looked smooth. He looked good. He looked like a guy that's been taught the basics, the fundamentals. Um, he's throwing straight punches. He's keeping his hands up. His form, his technique is good. Uh, he's using his legs like his grandfather a little bit. You know, he didn't have to use them with this guy too much. But you could see there was a certain bounce, if you will, with his legs, a certain eagerness to use the legs, a certain comfort to use the legs. Uh, there was, a, again, there was a smoothness, a rhythm to what he was doing. He made it look good. You know, you could go and get rid of these guys that you're supposed to get rid of, and it doesn't mean you're going to look good doing it. You're just going to get rid of them. You know, sometimes in a crude way, sometimes in an ugly way. He did it in a not ugly way. He did it in a way that, like I said, it, it looked good. He, uh, he used his jab. He threw straight right hand counters. The, the guy was leaving himself available to throw right hands. He was covering slow with his left hand. He was throwing the left hand from too close. And he recognized that to his credit. He was calm enough to recognize that and make a commitment to throwing a right hand over it, knowing that he could cash in that way, knowing that he could land that, that counter right hand over that slow jab. He did. He dropped him with that. He finished him with that. Um, again, he knows what he's doing. Uh, you can only ascertain so much against this level of opponent. But what I did ascertain for the folks out there, and I'm reporting back to you as I promised I would, that's my job. He, he's put in the time to learn what he has to learn. To what he'll do down the road, we don't know. How, we don't know how it will translate with better fighters yet. We don't know that. But he looked good with this obviously hand-picked opponent that was picked to lose. But he did the right things. Like I said, he his form was good. He was fluid. There was a fluidity to him. And that's important to use that word because with Ali, there was always a fluidity. There was, I'm not comparing him to his grandfather. Don't think I lost my mind. I didn't lose my mind, please. Not yet, not yet. But... There was a fluidity. There was a smoothness. There was a flow to what he did. And um, he had decent hand speed. Was it scintillating? No, but it was decent. It was, it was, it was good. It was good. Um, was there one area of talent that stuck out that I could say, wow, you could build a career around the power. You could build a career around the speed. You could build a career around the, you know, just the finesse, the the sophistication of of cleverness. Uh, no, but that's not necessarily a negative, because I didn't see anything that was jumped out at me that was poor. That was that I could say, well, he's not going to make it because of that. I didn't see that either. Did I see one thing that I could say was great? Like I said, no. But I saw a lot of things that were good. There's something to be said about that. And I didn't see one thing that was bad, that was like, oh, that's bad. I didn't see that either. And that's, that's, that's a positive. That's positive. So, you know, as, as he moves down the road and fights better guys, We'll find out how he is mentally, how he deals with pressure, how he is when he's tested, when that day comes. Um, it won't come any day short, being that his name's Ali. It won't come any day soon uh, because they will do what they do in boxing. I can almost predict he'll probably get to at least 12, 15 fights before they think about him having to really face anybody where you'd have to take a deep breath, if you will. Um, so I could say this. I said it to the writer. I said, I could probably predict 
that they know what they're doing. They're picking up guys, knowing why they're doing it because, you know, his name. I could probably predict there's a good chance he'll get to 15-0. and 0. And now people are going to say, oh, my God, you're saying he's really, really good. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm saying understand what I understand in the business, that there's enough guys out there to pick from, plenty of them, where this guy's good enough, good enough to get to 15-0, and 0, if that's what they want to do, or even 20-0, and 0, or 17-0, and 0, if, if that's what they want to do. Take them out of town, fight them over here where they can, you know, the commission will allow this fight even when you get up there a little more, where this will be allowed, that will be allowed, you know, where, as the old times would say, you could bring your own music. You know, you could bring your own music. And so I, they can get them to, to a, a good record. What he'll be once he gets there, what his development will be once he gets there, and how that will how that will how that will mix with the tougher opponents i don't know I, 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 maybe he's a guy that will progress during that journey to a level where when i see him at 15 and 0 if he gets there i'll say wow he's progressing you know what he can beat better guys now but he's good enough now at least to build a record um, with hand-picked opponents, again, we're always honest, and where, you know, he's he's got enough of a base of technique and ability to at least go down that road. So that's it. That's uh, the next the next great alley is on his way. Well, TBD to be determined. Um, next weekend, entertaining fight. Jake Paul and Tyron Woodley should bring in uh, a big audience, I would imagine. Um, this, uh, before we get into the fight, let me say that uh, if you're going to place a wager on the bet, please go to my bookie. Check them out at mybookie.ag. Use the promo code ATLAS for 50% credit on your first deposit, up to $1,000. The line on this one, Teddy, is Jake Paul's minus 200. Tyron Woodley is plus 170. We've got a line on the over-under that we'll get into when we break down the fight. But um, tell me what you're looking for in this one, and are you looking forward to seeing what happens here? Jake Paul seems to be, I mean, he hasn't really been tested, so to speak, but it should be an interesting test against Tyron Woodley, who does have extensive combat sports experience. He's been a, he's been a world title holder in the UFC. He's got deep, deep experience in the UFC, so the, the, the lights aren't going to get to him. Um, what do you think? You know, I think that I... Sorry I have to say what I'm about to say <laughs> um, because it contradicts what you just said uh, to, to, to the extent that... I, and the reason I'm sorry I have to say it has got nothing to do with being against Paul or against Woodley or for Paul. For, I, I give Paul credit. I give the brothers all the credit in the world. They're out there doing it the American way. They figured out a way to make money. They're not hurting anybody. You know, I mean, they might hurt the opponent, but I mean, uh, it's a fight business, so that's that's inherent with the business. Just like football, you might hurt a guy when you're in the fight, but they're not maliciously going out there to do anything wrong, break any laws. <coughs> they found a way with their great following to make money at this and to get people's attention and to get people's imagination. You know what? credit to you credit to you guys really I, I mean it a lot of people get angry at me Teddy you're a boxing guy your whole life uh, this crap this, this it takes away it doesn't take away from anything a restaurant could be a beautiful restaurant across the street and another restaurant opens up across the street. Is it taking anything away from that restaurant? No, the people have a choice of which one it's uh, you have a choice of which restaurant you want to go in it's your choice if anything it, it might make things better it might make things better because it draws more people to the neighborhood. It draws more people to say, hey, yeah, I didn't know that restaurant was here. I'll go to that restaurant next time. You know, you give people a choice. You're bringing people, they're paying attention to the sport. I know, again, I know a lot of people are poo-pooing it and they're putting their fingers on their nose and saying this stinks, this 
this is terrible. Uh, you're taken away from real fighting. No, it's the choice of the people if they want to pay, if they want to watch it. Yeah, don't tell me it's taken away from the integrity of the sport. The people still know what the real fights are. People still know what the real fighters are. People are still going to want to see Spence and Crawford, you know, and, and all those other fights that unfortunately we don't. And maybe that's part of the problem. We don't get the fights people want. So maybe they have to go and, uh, and be satisfied with this. Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe some of the promoters should take some of the blame if there's such a thing as blame for the phenomena that's going on right now with this stuff. And, and if you gave the people what they want, maybe, maybe they wouldn't have to go and, and seek out this, uh, the curiosity of, of these kind of matches. Maybe. But either way... I don't necessarily think that's all true. I wouldn't put all the blame on the promoters because they don't give us the best fight that that's why this is happening. This is happening because the curiosity of people have they follow they follow the YouTube guys and now they went and they play they play these games and now their guy is actually playing a game in real life. He's, he's playing a video game in a ring, in real life. It's the Matrix Unplugged. It's, 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 it's they, they're, real life, they're, they're in the ring. Oh, my God, that's my guy. That's the YouTube guy. He's my guy, and he's in a ring, and he's fighting, and he's doing something people said he, we couldn't do, and they're doing it with him. That's the phenomenon of this. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And people are following it because of that. That's a big part of it. And these guys are leading the way. Give them credit. Yeah, again, it's not destroying the integrity. You know, it's destroying the integrity of my sport. These these corrupt organizations, these these corrupt decisions, and 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 crooked judges and crooked organizations. That's destroying the dignity, and 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 the respect of my beloved sport, boxing, that I've been in almost 50 years. That's hurting it. That's chasing people away. And, and all these mismatches, that's, that's hurting it. But they're not hurting it. They're just giving an option to people to see something else, to go to a different restaurant. The people that love boxing, that want to see the good fights, they're still going to be there for the good fights if you give them to them. If you give, they know the difference. They know the difference. Now, the next thing I'm going to say, like I said, it's going to make some people's heads explode. And and uh, and another thing, before I, I finish about Paul, Woodley, I like Woodley. He represents himself. He's been a champion. He's been maybe the uh, just a great, what was he, welterweight, maybe the greatest welterweight champion of all time in the UFC. I mean, he's that special. He's that damn special. He's that damn special, and he carries himself like a champion. So I love this guy, too. I, I mean, he, I got nothing but admiration for him, and I have admiration just for Paul, what he's doing. That I give him credit. I give him credit, that's all, for what he's doing. I, I know he can't beat a real one of, one of the fighters, uh, boxers, and, and my, I, I, I understand that. But that's not what this is about. This is about capturing the people's imagination. And I know the imagination goes bonkers. It goes cuckoo. Cuckoo, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And the imagination can go a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. It can. Where people start saying, all right, you know what? Uh, he would beat, uh, I think he might beat Spence. Wow! Well, I, I think he might beat Crawford. I, I, I think he might beat, uh, I, I think he might beat Joshua. Listen, I'm, I'm just joking around, but there's people out there that actually start to get a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. They do. They get a little cuckoo. But having said that, we understand the realm of what this is. We do. And, and I give Paul credit that he gets ready, that he went and he learned the sport. He put the time in. He respected the sport. He, he learned what he needed to learn to represent himself the best he could. I give him credit for that. And like I said, Woodley's been a great champion. But Woodley's 39 years old, right? He's, he's lost his last four fights. And he's lost his last two by KO and submission. So he's not in a... He's, listen, I say it, and this is not to disrespect for. I already said the things I needed to say about how much I respect the guy, but he's shot. He, he has the look of a shot fighter uh, in, in, in MMA, 
and UFC. And now there's a lot of people going to say because he is a professional fighter and a champion, a former champion, that he's going to beat Paul. I get it. But you're looking at a guy who's 39, who's lost his last four fights, who's lost his last two by submission and KO. Now, listen, it's at a different level. It's, so it's one thing I'll say is the TKO was a, a rib injury. He, 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 just, he got hit in the ribs, and he started just tapping. I don't know if he tore something in his ribs, but he was like basically tapped out. So, Yeah, but, but I mean, he, he, still, you know, he still got to a place where he, he had to submit. Yes. And, and what I'm saying is he's in a bad place mentally. He's in a bad place physically. Um, he's not in his best place. Now, having said what I said, those being at that losing those last four fights and everything else, 39 years old, that he lost those to real fighters. Yes. He didn't lose that to a YouTube guy who's been fighting for X amount of time. I get it. I understand, again, all of it. But was, and this will make people's head explode, so I'll get right to it. Paul is like Mayweather. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, clean it up. <laughs> get, the, get the Lysol out. Get all the stuff. Clean up all that brain matter that's all over the walls that just went... <laughs> really you got to clean that stuff up got to clean it up can't let it sit out there this you know like a pulp fiction movie you can't you got to clean it up you got to get the got to call mr wolf got to <laughs> call mr wolf come in here and let's let's clean this mess up he's like mayweather but now that you you went nuts and your brains exploded let me explain that he's smart and he picks his opponents very well and Mayweather was always good at that. Mayweather was great. He was a great fighter. He beat great fighters. He, he was great. But he, he, especially in his later career, he was very good at picking his opponents. Very good and very smart to his credit. And he deserved the ability to do that because he earned it. He earned the right to do that. And Paul has been doing that very well. Now, Paul saw what I saw. I watched the, I do my work. I do my due diligence. I knew I was going to break this down for the fans out there. So I went and watched Woodley's fights from the striking standpoint, obviously. And he's, as I said, he's already at a place where he's not at his best place athletically anymore. But he's got to happen. His style... He stands straight up. He doesn't move his head. When he was younger, every once in a while, he would slip his head and he would counter with the right hand. He doesn't really do that. He stands straight in the middle. That's a problem. And he's got a good right hand, Woodley. He's got a good... He, he likes to throw with a little bit of a loop. Sometimes he can throw straight. It's got power. It's got real power. If he lands that, can he, can he hurt Paul? Yes. 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 He's got a good right hand. But... He's got a style and a habit, Woodley, of pushing out his left hand, his jab, to set up, to land the right hand. As I say, you use, you got to have, you got to have power, but you got to have a delivery system. His, his delivery system was he would catch guys coming at him. He would time them. He did a good job. He would throw at the same time. He would time them. He, he'd catch them coming in. Sometimes he'd catch them going back. Um... You know, sometimes he catch them over their jab, but he doesn't. The delivery system that's broken here, that I think that Paul's gonna take advantage of, is that Woodley has a habit. For the people that are watching this, not just listening on iTunes or something, but are watching it, I'm gonna illustrate. He's got a habit of pushing his jab, which is never good, and throwing a jab half its length. Like, it doesn't get full extension. He only throws it like half, halfway halfway out. Now, by throwing it halfway out, obviously he's waiting for the right hand. He's looking to set up the right hand. But by pushing it out there, two things are happening. By not extending it, you're allowing your opponent to get closer. Because if you extend it, you, you, you make a line. You can't get closer than that. You're keeping a guy at a certain distance. You can't get any closer than that. I'm keeping you at that di distance. If you're going to get closer, beware. There's going to be danger. Beware. But now you're not making a guy really beware. 
You're not making them really tentative about anything. You're letting them, by throwing a half a jab, you're letting him close in on you. You're letting him get closer than he normally could feel comfortable getting that close. You're giving him access. You're, you're letting him in. It's, it's tantamount to opening your door and letting somebody come into your foyer. If you don't want him, don't open the door. <laughs> you don't want him in your foyer because you don't like them or they could do, don't open your door. Well, he opens his door. By throwing it halfway, he allows you to get into his foyer. So he allows you to get closer than normally you would be allowed to get. That's number one. Number two, by pushing the jab that way and by keeping his head straight, by not having head movement, as I described earlier, when he does that, he allows you to time right hands over that push jab, over that half a jab, where as you're throwing that half a jab, you get close, and you can time a right hand, bang, right over it. It's like opening a window and letting things come in the window. Bugs, hornets, bees, <laughs> pollen. Pollen's bad too, uh, especially if you've if you got allergies. But right hands are worse than pollen. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you right now. It, it's worse. And so here's the thing. <coughs> he allows you to get close where you can counter with right hands. Paul's got a good right hand. I'm not saying he's got a right hand compared to 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 this guy or to that guy in professional boxing. I'm not saying that because he hasn't had to land it on those level fighters. He hasn't had to show that. But I will tell you that he has a decent, he's a big guy, he's strong, he's in shape. As I said, he respects the sport. He's learned the basic things that he had to learn. And he throws a pretty good right hand, but here's the trick. He's confident throwing that right hand. He believes in it. Whether he's right or wrong, so far he's been right with the guys in front of him. And he's going to believe that he can land that right hand with the opportunity I just described that Woodley gives him. He believes he's going to land that right hand. And he's a bigger, naturally bigger guy. He, the, the, that's the one thing about, he's bigger than all the guys he's fighting. He was bigger than Askren. Uh, he, he had 20 pounds on Askren. I don't care what weight Askren came in. Askren wasn't in top shape. When Askren was in top shape, he was 20 pounds less. He was 20 pounds less. That's a fact. And the same thing with Woodley. When Woodley was in top shape, he was 20 pounds less than what he's than than what Paul fights at. But he's going to fight Paul's weight, and and he's going to be at a big disadvantage. He's going to be the smaller guy, the lighter guy, and Paul's so Paul's the bigger guy. He's strong. He's going to has that advantage, and he's got the opportunity to throw, which is a decent right hand that he possesses. He's got the opportunity to throw it and land it because of what I just described is the style of Woodley and the mistakes of Woodley, if you will. Uh, he, 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 he stands straight up. He's predictable. He throws that slow jab. He throws it halfway out. He lets you get close. Paul's got a good right hand. He's going to land the right hand. So the bad news is Paul's going to knock him out. I, and and I, I, listen, maybe I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, good, because I like Woodley. I like, I, I like listen, I don't know Paul, but I, I have nothing against what he, I said. I get admiration for what he's doing. Give him credit. Uh, but I think that if it, the way I'm looking at it, uh, he, he took this fight for a reason. He picked this fight for a reason because he could sell it because there could be credibility attached to it. Like you said at the top, and rightfully so, Ken, you said at the top, you know, he's fighting a guy that this could be tough. He's fighting a guy, Woodley, who's, who, who's a striker, who's a champion, who, you know, and that's why, that's part of the reason why it's going to sell. And part of the reason why he picked Woodley, because there is credibility. You can attach credibility to this fight, saying the guy can win. The guy's a, he was a former champion. The guy's an MMA fighter, for Christ's sakes. The guy's a UFC former champion, for Christ's sakes. This guy's a YouTuber. Yeah, yeah. Askren was a UFC uh, guy, too. 
that was undefeated at a certain point in his career in the UFC. But he wasn't a striker. And he had flaws. And his flaw was pushing out the jab slow or going straight back. And again, Paul was able to take advantage of that flaw. He was, he was to his credit. And I think he sees the same thing here. An opportunity to take advantage. Yeah, the guy was a, was a, the guy was a champion fighter. Yeah, all of that. But I'm a bigger guy. I'm a younger guy. And the guy has a flawed technique that I can take advantage of. And I picked him for that reason. I also picked him because, as I just said, we can sell this. We can get people to say, hey, Let's see this. Let me ask you this, Ed, for the people who are looking to place a wager with my bookie. Uh, minus 200 on Jake Paul. Do you like him that much to lay 200? Yeah, probably. Probably. I, he's not picking it. He's got all the advantages. He's doing the picking here. He's doing That's the picking point. here. Woodley's not doing the picking. Remember when you were in the schoolyard playing basketball and you were the guy who did the picking? <laughs> you could pick the team. You, you looked over there, and you, you, you had a bunch of uh, 10-year-old kids, and, and then all of a sudden you saw one that was uh, six foot ten, <laughs> and you were like, I'll pick him. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't make you Pat Riley, by the way. That didn't make you Red Orback. You well, know what I mean? Yeah. But I'll pick, I'll pick him. I'll take that six foot ten guy. I, uh, yeah, well, you have an advantage when you're doing the picking, right, baby? So he's got a pick. He's he's doing the picking. Let me ask picking. you this one. Over three and a half rounds, plus 115. Under three and a half, minus 135. What do you like in the over-under? I like the under. Interesting. I like the under. All right. For the guys looking to make a place a wager, guys or girls, uh, mybookie.ag. Use the promo code Atlas for 50% credit on your first deposit. This is going to be a fun one. And you know who's going to be there ringside, Teddy? Yours truly, the guy <laughs> that's, got the, that's, that's ready to fight. The guy with the fight shirt. Don't wear that shirt. <laughs> I love the shirt. I love the company. I, we talked about it. Um, I'm going to get myself in shape so I can wear the mediums that they sent me. They sent me <laughs> mediums. Come on, send me a large. But um, they said, you're the right size. See, you're getting big. You're getting bigger <laughs> by the moment. Really. I, I, I didn't get that. But don't, as, as nice a shirt, and what I like about really this, this company with the shirts we're talking about that, we're fortunate enough they came on to be a sponsor and we appreciate that is that they stand for something they give money to charities as we talked yeah. about early on they stand for something they care about life they care about people and they give you sayings on their shirts that remind you of what you should be reminded of that's right how important life is how important it is that you conduct yourself a certain way every day and you don't forget that every day. So um, th having said all that nice stuff, don't wear that. I don't <laughs> want nobody saying, oh, yeah, you want to fight your Ken right out uh, from the fight. Yeah. Okay. Come on. I don't, I don't want you having to knock anybody out um, <laughs> before you go to your race in London. <laughs> Uh, what's the date on your race so everybody can be? October uh, 3rd, cheering. Sunday. Uh, yeah, October 3rd, okay. But no so one's going to knock me 3rd. out at the fight. I'm bringing a very special guest. I'm not going to say who, but let's just say he'll be a very good bodyguard for me. So come and see yes. me at the fight ringside at the Woodley-Paul uh, fight. Yeah, and, come uh, say hello to, to <laughs> Ken, uh, the, the man. Ken's the man. <laughs> Ken is the man. He's my man, and he's the man. Well, Teddy, thanks for doing this. We covered a lot. I know this was a long one. Appreciate all the fans. If you're still watching, please hit the subscribe button. We're trying to get those subscribers up on YouTube. It helps us a lot with a million different metrics. So appreciate everyone being with us, and we'll be back next week for a full breakdown of the uh, Paul and uh, Woodley fight. And thanks for being with us. Thanks, Teddy. And remember, remember one thing. Don't run 20 miles today if it's humid out. Please. No, I did it yesterday. Cut it down. Today's recovery day. 10 miles easy. Uh, all right. But the next time, even when it's not recovery day, listen to me. Yeah. If it's really, really crazy human, cut it down a little bit. Yes. Okay? Yep. All right. You got Thank it. You. All right, guys. Thank you.
All right, guys, it's our special privilege today to be joined by author Kelly Motley, author of the book, The Fight for My Life, Boxing Through Chemo. Kelly, thanks for being with us. It's very nice to meet you. Kelly, it's great to have you with us. Uh, love that great smile. You're, you, if anyone's a fighter, you're a fighter. And, you know, the first thing that I'm going to say is that when I started this podcast, a lot of people ask me, what do you hope to accomplish, Teddy? Uh, what is your goal in this podcast? Obviously, we're going to talk about boxing. I kind of know a little bit about boxing. It's been my whole life. And w what am I going to talk about? I'm not going to talk about, you know, how to be a good fast food cook. But for me, boxing is life. And it's been my entire life just about. And I had hoped that if I did anything with this podcast, that it would be to connect the dots for people out there uh, f for their own fights. Because I think everybody's in a fight. Uh, life is a fight. It's, it's the biggest arena in the world. And, and we're all involved one way or another in a fight. It's just a matter of what you fight for. And so I couldn't think of a better guest, really, at this point to have on our podcast than somebody who knows exactly what they're fighting for and fighting for something that, well, it doesn't get more important than what you're fighting for. You're fighting for your life, for your existence. And, um, and you, have a, you, know, you have a tough opponent. It's cancer. And so that, that's it for me. Take it from there, Kelly. And tell us about that fight. There's a lot of people out there that need to know about that fight, need to know how you're doing it, how you're using boxing to do it, and how you're winning it. So, Teddy, what you need to know is that boxing not only gave me a life lesson, but it literally and figuratively saved my life. I discovered the sport of boxing in the summer of 2017, and I believe the universe was kindly, quietly guiding me, giving me the very best to equip myself as I was unknowingly getting ready for one of the biggest duels of my life. So um, before I discovered boxing, I was in a dull, hard uh, resignation that I would forever be stuck in life. Uh, I was running a successful PR business and I was dealing with a major issue with a client and every single day felt like uh, a bout where I was unevenly matched. And um, I, I live in a 1924 home and everything in the home seemed to be breaking, never to be fixed. And I uh, had a, a really bad day. And I one day I felt like I was on the brink. I wanted to punch something that very day. And I pulled a car out of it up the road to a popular boxer size gym. And uh, just uh, I joined a group class and started pounding away at the bag. I saw my client's face on the bag. <laughs> uh, I thought I was going to be really good at this boxing thing because I had so much anger and rage. Someone might have thought I had Tourette's, but what I didn't know um, as I was standing there punching, uh, throwing static, uh, angry punches at this bag is that the last thing you want to be when you're boxing is angry. So I ended up getting uh, taking, taking uh, Jeet Kune Do and really loving it, but I, I needed to get better at boxing. And so what I did is I started taking um, – lessons three days a week with a professional uh, super middleweight boxer, Senna Akbeko from Ghana, and Christy Halbert, who is a former Olympic boxing coach, and really started learning the principles, the technique of boxing. And what I discovered is I started using these techniques that I was learning, um, mental, physical techniques to get me stronger. And what it did is it gave me a lot of new energy in my life. Uh, my business started uh, taking off in a way that I could have never in a million years imagined. And, um, and so I discovered boxing and 
Uh, and, and a year later, uh, in 2018, uh, I got this cancer diagnosis. I was blindsided by this cancer diagnosis and then really pushed to the brink uh, where I felt my life was threatened with defeat. I, um, I was felt dragged ultimately into a fight that I wasn't prepared for, but rather than to shrink and surrender to the situation, I decided I was going to take these principles that I learned inside the ring to continue my business and to also uh, keep a strong mental and physical well-being. And so I wrote the book that I wished I would have had when I got my diagnosis. And it's really a book that offers a hope, a plan, a belief, and an approach to help people understand they don't have to adapt to a tough situation. Sometimes they can make that situation adapt and adjust to them. You know, that um, I've always said, Kelly, in my, in my almost 50 years, I hate to admit that, but wow, it's 50 years uh, in boxing, both on ESPN and throughout my career as a trainer, I've always said that my sport, the sport of boxing, is 75% mental. How much of your fight, how much did you find out um, through your journey, that how much of your fight is mental and how much is physical? So you raised a really good point. You, you always talk about how boxing is a mindset and healing and getting over cancer is a mindset. There are so many commonalities between boxing and cancer. If you think about the unpredictability and the, the you you feel the time that you know take the, the seconds ticking down. You you feel the courage, the despair, the vulnerability, the the um, the, the 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 bleeding and the, the swollenness and all of those other physical pieces that come with it. So, you know, the mind is, is such a critical part. And what my corner taught me was um, that pity is a destructive force and that it, it requires energy and that it can put you in a really dark place. And so my corner, the people who I spent time with, my coaches, there really wasn't a lot of room for that. Um, and they spent a lot of time focusing on intention and visualization and asking me, where do you want to be two years? Where do you want to be five years from now? So th those mental pieces were really critical. Um, when, I was, when I would be dealing with my difficult client, I would have my boxing gloves, which I have here today. Um, I would have those on the table in front of me, always like looking at them. Um, when I was getting ready f to go under the knife, I always had my videos going of my training. They were all, my coaches were really good about capturing images for me so that when I was in a hospital or I was getting chemo, I was always looking at my training videos to keep me mentally strong. I don't say this, you know, quickly i think about it before i say things try to be responsible and um and i think the people on this show expect me to be that listen to the show expect me to be responsible but i i think that you're a special fighter and that you represent an entire group of people who are sick and they need another way aside from the medicine so to speak uh to fight their fight they, you know, listen, don't get me wrong. You need a good hospital. You need good doctors. You need good medicine. You need a good gym. You need good training facilities. Uh, you, need, <laughs> you need to physically work hard. You need all those things. But at the end of the day, you need something else. You, you need to believe that you can win. You need to believe that you can put a light into a dark place when it seemed like there was never going to be light in that dark place. And I think you represent that for those people out there. I really do. Um, that you can kind of bring forward that lantern, if you will, of light and, and of hope that can tell the people, hey, when it gets a little dark, this is what you do. And for those people that are listening right now that are part of that group and, and you represent them right now, what do you directly say to them when it seems like there is no light? What do you say to them? So in my personal experience, I needed to dictate and move and dictate the pace of the fight. 
And so there were a couple of things that were really basic that I could lean into. When I first started boxing with Senna Agbeko, one morning he said to me, hey, imagine that we've strapped a tool belt around your waist and we're stocking it with tools that you can use. This is going to give you more options. If it's empty, you're not going to have a lot to reach for. So I started really thinking about the mental and the physical uh, techniques that I got from boxing, the things that were said to me every day when I'm hitting the speed bag. You know, you're, you're the ultimate controller. You make this adjust and adapt to you. You look for patterns, um, you know, all the different principles around executing with confidence about um, avoiding when you're doing when you're slipping or rolling you know a lot of people have a tendency to want to lean away from a threatening situation but when you're slipping and rolling that's the last thing you want to do you're going to be more well balanced if you lean into your opponent and so that's what I tried to do um, just a lot of, of the principles thinking uh, really carefully about who is in your corner and who do you want to give your time to? How do you want to communicate this out? Um, like I said, you know, pity, pity can really take a person's mental and physical strengths. So to be thinking about who is in your corner and um, to also understand, you know, about, about adapting and adjusting to a tough situation that maybe the, you, you might need to change up your healthcare provider. Um, you might need to deal with an insurance issue that is really challenging, but to um, you know, have that mindset of a boxer and really believe in, and have confidence in yourself that you need to adapt and, and change these, these situations up on behalf of yourself. You know what you just said for me, what I took away from that, and it was obviously very well said, but what I just took away for that from that is something that I preach and something that I quite often talk about in my business in a fight where the greatest strength that you have, the greatest ability that you have, the greatest trait that you have, and people forget this sometimes, is the ability to make a choice, to make a choice. And when the pressure comes, when the fight comes, when the moment comes, whether it's a fight with cancer, whether it's a fight with a person in front of you in a ring, when that fight comes, that sometimes what comes with the pressure of that, the, the, the great pressure of that, I mean, it's like a tidal wave. It takes the air out of the room and chokes you. Where, like, you've, what am I going to do? And what the pressure does it makes you forget that it's always your choice. That's the most damaging thing that the pressure does, whether it's the pressure of dealing with a disease or, like I said, an opponent who keeps coming at you, that it makes you start to think it's not your choice. You have nothing to say. And that's what you're saying. What I always tell the fighters, it's always your choice. It's always your choice. No matter how tough it gets, no matter how difficult it gets, until you give up that choice, it's your choice how you're going to act, how you're going to behave, how you're going to fight. It's always your choice. And to me, that's the greatest thing about what I'm hearing from you is that you're reminding people in that fight, in the fight you know that you're dealing with in life, that no matter how tough it gets, no matter how bleak it gets, don't forget the one thing. Me, Kelly, I am telling you, don't forget. It's your choice what you it's your choice what you will do. It's your choice of how you're gonna act. Is that the message? Am I on track Absolute, with that? Absolutely. So this this book is about developing a stronger mind and body for facing your worst enemy. For some people, it might be bankruptcy, it might be cancer, it might be divorce, it might be something else, but it's really for that person who feels lonely, isolated, terrified by an unexpected circumstance. And I, I know firsthand what that unexpected circumstance looks like. Um, when, when you uh, are facing this kind of situation, 
you know, looking to the principles of boxing. Uh, one thing that I did was I got my body very clean. I start, I looked at, at, at the whole cancer diagnosis as a training camp, leaned into this macrobiotic diet um, and really got my body clean and, um, you know, got ready for this major fight so that, uh, you know, I could respect what exactly I was getting ready to go through with, the, uh, with all the chemo. No, that's great. Kelly, where can people find the book? So the book uh, is uh, at my website and it is uh, thefightformylife.com. It will be coming out August 24th and they can pre-order the book at thefightformylife.com. Kelly, when I started this conversation, I said that uh, I talked about how I always want to use this podcast to connect the dots uh, to everybody out there that's fighting the fight. And you definitely help us connect those dots. And you're special. You're special. You're a fighter. And you represent people out there that are fighting that are fighting the toughest fight there is against the toughest opponent there is. So continue the fight and continue to teach and inspire people how to fight this fight. Thank you, Teddy. Kelly, thanks so much for being with us. Um, Good luck with the book. I'm sure it's going to be an inspiration to a lot of people, and we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. All right. Take care.